Hi Chris here. Now I've got the second episode of Retro Histories in the bag. I thought it'd be fun to go back to the first one and do a sort of a production commentary where I go through talking about a lot of the things that are wrong with it, uh, some of the cut content and creative decisions that I made. It's kind of off the cuff and a little bit nerdy, but I thought it might be of interest to a few people. So here is the production commentary for last year's episode one of Retro Histories, The History of Might and Magic. First of all, the music here is something that I sort of dragged together from some loops in Garage Band. I'm not a musician of any stripe, but it's very easy to make a piece of music when you have all these sort of pre-baked little musical phrases that go together pretty well. Um, and then we're straight into a black screen on which we hold for four or five seconds there. That's really not the most auspicious of beginnings for this video. Um, this was the first time that I'd made something anywhere near this complex and, and uh, this scripted. So there's quite a lot of mistakes all the way through it that I'll bring up as we get to them. Um, on the whole, I'm relatively happy with it, but um, I know that I can do uh, quite a lot better. The whole Golden Age thing there, probably should have credited that, I think, to Matt Barton, who came up with that, the categorization of CRPGs. Um, and this whole year carousel thing, that was one of the last shots that I finished on the project because it's one of the mo more complicated. I had to learn quite a lot of After Effects in order to do that. Um, really wish I cleaned up that Might and Magic image there. You can see white pixels around the edge from where it's supposed to be on a white background, given that it's the title of the thing. I really should have uh, put more more effort into that. Um, I, I, all right, I should admit up front that I've never actually completed a Might and Magic game. I've never played one to completion. I've played several um, before making this video, and I played them all at least to some degree uh, in making this video, but I've never finished one, including the, the long-running uh, Let's Play of Might and Magic 6. But um, I, th I don't think that's necessarily that bad. Um, I saw a really good piece of advice on the internet once, which is uh, running counter to the to the write what you know uh, common sort of piece of advice. Uh, someone said that you should uh, write what you're willing to discover. And that's, um, that's sort of how I approach these. I come to uh, subjects that I know a little about, but by the end of the thing, I've researched it and I know a lot more about it, hopefully. And that sort of keeps the whole process interesting. If I'm just going in there making a whole thing about something I already know, I'm probably going to lose interest. There's quite a lot of the, the sorts of shots in this, um, in this video which is, um, I guess, what you would call a digital rostrum, where you've just got a single 2D page um, or an article or a screen grab and making some sort of a pan across it. That's a fairly commonplace thing to do in, in, in this sort of video, and I'm using it a lot in the ones that I've done more recently as well. Um, I find that just doing that in After Effects instead of Premiere uh, for the most part makes it just even a simple shot look about 500% better because you can add some motion blur on it and that just sells it as far less digital somehow. It can instantly uh, make it look better. The music here that I'm pulling, especially for these early sections, I'm pulling from the console versions of these games, but every time I'm talking about a game in this whole video, um, I'm underscoring it with music from that game, which is kind of, uh, you know, it's kind of of obvious, it probably, you know, is, is uh, fairly evident that that's what I'm, what I'm doing. But I learned something from uh, studying Mark Brown's videos. He does Game Maker's Toolkit um, that I'm trying to uh, exercise more in the future because he will be talking about a game and underscore it with music from potentially completely different games. Sometimes it doesn't even appear at all in the video. Um, but it's never a problem. It never, it's never sounds jarring. It never stands out because he's not matching on the game that he's talking about. He's not going that literal, but he just matches on mood and atmosphere. Um, so it's obvious. That, so sometimes it's 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 not at all obvious uh, that he's using uh, quote wrong music because it is totally appropriate. It's totally right for the moment. So. Um, I think going so literal in my choice of um, musical score here is, is just is, it was a bit of a lack of uh, imagination on my part. Not that I think the music in this section and in, in this video 
uh, works terribly. Uh, there are a few cases, a few places uh, where I think the music really reinforces the thing. Um, but I think I could have been looser with the choices. There was a whole section of the script, about 30 seconds worth, that I recorded and had in the timeline for the longest time around here. Uh, and unfortunately, had to had to lose it, um, which made me quite sad. Um, I, the, but the the most common reason um, I seem to encounter to have to drop a section is that that I like that seems to you know be working in script form but not in video form is when I just can't find anything to put on the screen for that section of video. And that was the case here. I was going to talk about um, the character of the uh, of this series of RPGs and contrast it with others. I was going to talk about how it was light-hearted, how there were a lot of pop culture references in it. It didn't take itself all that seriously. Um, and I feel that by um, by by cutting that out, because I I, I would have had to find lots and lots of short clips to uh, back that point. Um, and I was getting close to the end. I really wanted to get the video out. So I ended up just cutting that whole section out. But there's almost nothing that really characterizes this series in the video now. I, I feel that it's a real loss. Um, yeah, I think I think that's a real that's a real shame that I ended up having to lose that. I wish I could have uh, gone back and reworked the script and got something uh, of that in there somehow. Um, John Van Kanigam there, who just appeared, um, there is very little footage out there of interviews that are relevant to Might and Magic. He seemed to only make uh, any appearances on, on, on camera at all after the demise of New World Computing, so there's not that much in the way of relevant footage for this uh, video. I think that's somewhat rare. I mean, not everyone is a, a publicity hound, but I think for the most part, most other game subjects at least have, even if they haven't done television, they've maybe appeared on a panel on at GDC or on a podcast or did a short promotional video for the launch of a game. Um, but this, I was, I was, I'm, I'm almost entirely using text interviews uh, of John Van Kanigan. Um, I quite like this little interlude here where we go into what else is happening in CRPGs and that's just sort of briefly show the resurgence of it and then fade back out. John Van Kanigan has actually got a new game out, but I haven't played it. I can't really say anything about it. It's a mobile game. It seems to be some sort of freemium thing called Creature Quest, but it's only launched in a few countries, and that doesn't include the UK. It doesn't even include the United States. So I'm not able to play it or say anything about it, um, even though it's been out in like Australia, New Zealand, Hong Kong, the Netherlands, and another country that I, I don't remember. Um, for months and months, there seems to be no sign that it's um, coming here anytime soon, and I don't really understand why the game would be launched that way. Uh, hmm. Quite quite happy with this whole section here. Um, the timing the edits to the to the music, uh, or at least par partially. It's probably something I should have done more through through the rest of the thing. There were more um, but a nice piece of music there from, I think, Might and Magic uh, 7, uh, backing this section about 7 and 8. A lot of the video of the games um, is not video that I recorded myself, it's uh, footage from other Let's Players, which is, uh, of course, uh, are all credited and attributed appropriately in the credits and in the description. Um, I'll come back to that in a sec. This uh, this whole thing with the heroes timeline, that's not a gag. That's all the products and that is, as best I can tell, the sequence in which you have to follow them for um, for a chronological storyline. Uh, and there's a dumb joke there uh, about the stranglers. Um, I like putting stupid jokes in videos, but um, the balance in this video is 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 not good because we're um, like eight minutes in before the first dumb joke, and then there's like three in the next five minutes. Um, so I think uh, even though they may be things that only I enjoy, 
Um, I'm going to continue putting them in, but I'm going to try and make sure that there's one like every four minutes. This piece of music that I'm talking about, uh, Might and Magic 9, was a godsend. First, I was going to use the Might and Magic 6 music, which is a sort of like a mournful, funereal adagio with Gregorian monk chants and stuff. If you played the game, you probably know the one I mean. But it just, it was so on the nose. When I played it, it was almost laughably bad. Laughably bad um, because it was really telling you what to think. Uh, so instead, I was really happy that I found this very ambiguous piece of music from Might Magic 9 to underscore the, the, the sad story of the, pre, the early release and the failure of Might Magic 9. Because this piece of music, there's just something about it that is like weirdly bittersweet, like there's moments of beauty in it and there's moments of drama and it, it's like the opposite of a piece of music that tells you what to think. It's such an unusual piece. The thing that I feel is weakest in this video is there's no sense of narrative structure to it. It just goes through events in sequence, bam, 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 um, and then just sort of tails off at the end. There's just, there's no resolution. There's no setup of a question at the start. There's no answer at the end. It's just a chronological sequence of events. And that's something that I'm trying to do better on in videos that I make in the future. I was really only preoccupied here with getting the facts into the script and then getting video and audio to match. But there's also a higher level that a video has to work on, which it needs to be engaging, it needs to tell a story. And that's something on which this, frankly, fails, and future videos, I hope, are going to succeed. Another dumb joke here, this Ubisoft logo, um, I actually had sitting around on my hard drive since before making this video, so I, I didn't actually make it for the joke. I made the joke for Twitter years ago and then ended up putting it on the video. Oh yeah, so I was going to talk about um, how I'd uh, reused people's footage. Um, it was really the, that was really the only way to make a video like this. It would have taken months longer if I had to play through games to a degree to get uh, representative footage of a lot of it. This is trailer footage, that's not, uh, that's not uh, Let's Play footage. But for the most part, the, I am using Let's Play footage. There were a few bits that I recorded for myself. The PC Engine version of Might and Magic 1, there was no footage anywhere online that I, as far as I could tell. So I recorded my own footage of that through an emulator. But for the most part, I'm using things that I've downloaded off YouTube and I'm giving full credit at the end. And that sort of philosophy of uh, it being better to ask forgiveness than permission, I think, is appropriate here. I mean, I, I, I don't think that's necessarily uh, a bad thing to do here. I think what I'm doing here is fair use. And I'm not ripping anyone off, I'm not seeking to deny anyone credit for anything. But if someone's recording a game, or if they've recorded a press conference or something and just happened to upload that video, I don't think that it's a bad thing that they that someone else can use their footage in a different context. I mean, I'm not using their voice anywhere uh, either. I'm not using anything personally identifiable. So I would record everything that I could, but hopefully uh, it's not too much of an objectionable thing to uh, use things like this. Um, the music here on the credits, very happy with it. It's another version of the tune that we uh, that played in a more, much more simple MIDI version back earlier in the film, the Might and Magic 5 um, theme. Uh, but this is an orchestrated version by a guy called Azomath. Um, really fantastic, and hopefully um, using it earlier in the video and then coming in with um, a stronger version of it at the end. Even if you're not familiar with the music, it does land with a greater impact, hopefully, um, because you've already heard it once. All right, we're coming to the end now of this production commentary. I think looking back on this one was instructive. I definitely leveled up in a few ways between episodes one and two, and I may do a similar commentary for episode two somewhere down the line if anyone's interested in that. Drop me a comment if that's something you might want to watch. I'll end by saying thanks very much for listening and for your interest in the making of retro histories. If you're interested in more behind the scenes type stuff, follow me on Twitter at RetroHistories. That's where I share the process of making upcoming videos.